Hi, I'm Hannah Piper, a pediatric surgeon at BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver, British Columbia. Today, my colleague Debbie Martin, the pediatric dietitian, and I will be presenting a video addressing the initial management strategies for preventing and treating malnutrition in pediatric intestinal failure. Intestinal failure in children occurs when the gut does not function sufficiently to support normal growth and development. Although there are a variety of disease processes that can result in intestinal failure in the pediatric population, short bowel syndrome, resulting from the loss of small intestine, is by far the most common cause. This is typically due to neonatal intestinal diseases such as necrotizing enterocolitis, intestinal atresia, midgut volvulus, and gastroschisis, but can also be acquired later in life. For the remainder of the presentation, we will focus primarily on children with short bowel syndrome. However, the majority of the principles can also be applied to other types of intestinal failure. After a child loses a significant amount of small bowel, the immediate nutritional management addresses three main issues. To begin with, these children will typically have high gastric output, and many will have a proximal small bowel stoma that also has high volume losses. As a result, it is important to maintain appropriate fluid and electrolyte balance during this period. This requires close monitoring and replacement of losses, as well as at least short-term suppression of gastric secretions with acid blockade. Finally, during this period, the gut generally cannot be used for nutrition, and there is complete reliance on parenteral nutrition support. Therefore, a secure central venous catheter or PIC is required for the safe delivery of PN. It's important to remember when caring for children that a positive fluid balance is required for normal growth. For children with high intestinal losses, this can necessitate providing one and a half to two times the typical maintenance volume on a daily basis. A given child's specific needs are dynamic, depending on output, and therefore must be closely monitored by considering urine output, daily weight, and serum chemistry, among other clinical markers. These children also tend to have high sodium losses that can sometimes go undetected because serum sodium can be preserved even in the setting of total body sodium depletion. Monitoring urine electrolytes is a useful way to assess sodium status. In the presence of an intestinal ileus during the initial postoperative phase, parenteral nutrition is the only possible option for nutrition support. It provides the fluid and nutrients that are critical for healing and adequate growth. Energy requirements vary greatly, greatly with age, ranging from as much as 90 to 120 kcals per kilo in the preterm infant to as low as 30 to 50 kcals per kilo in adolescents. Overfeeding of calories from PN with excess of any macronutrient is associated with hepatic steatosis. Children on parental nutrition should be monitored closely to ensure the prescription doesn't provide nutrition in excess of their specific requirements. Dextrose is the primary source of PN calories and oxidative capacity varies with age. Overfeeding dextrose or providing glucose infusion rates above recommendations has been associated with hepatic steatosis and should be avoided in long-term PN patients. Whenever the GIR is pushed above recommendations to support quality of life, the patient should be closely monitored. Protein is provided to support metabolism and amino acids are best utilized when provided as part of a balanced PN solution. Similar to energy and dextrose, protein requirements vary with age. BUN should be monitored to assess for safety and adequacy of protein intake. Lipids provide a rich source of energy and of essential fatty acids and requirements vary with age. Overfeeding lipids or providing lipid infusion rates in excess of recommendations have been associated with hepatic steatosis and should be avoided in long-term PN patients. Triglycerides should be monitored to assess tolerance to lipids and should ideally be maintained below 150 mg per deciliter. If prolonged little restriction is required, monitoring for essential fatty acid deficiency is prudent and whenever possible, a minimum of 0.5 to 1 gram per kilo per day of lipids should be provided. Finally, early electrolyte, trace element, and vitamin supplementation is essential to prevent nutrient deficiencies common in intestinal failure. Early introduction of ventral nutrition is a key factor in promoting intestinal autonomy. It stimulates intestinal adaptation, preserves mucosal integrity, and decreases the risk of bacterial translocation. Ventral nutrition should be initiated as soon as the postoperative ileus has resolved, although controversy still exists around the optimal feeding plan. The choice of formula, the feeding route, and modality will be discussed on the next slides. Once these have been determined and feeds have been initiated, the child should be monitored closely for signs of intolerance. 
These may include increased stool output, abdominal distension, and new or worsening emesis. If not addressed properly, these can result in poor growth. Specific nutritional needs will depend on the intestinal anatomy, including both what has been lost and what remains. Although there's plenty of redundancy built into the intestinal tract, there are some site-specific roles. For example, the duodenum is the primary site for iron, iron absorption. The jejunum is best at absorbing carbohydrates, protein, and water-soluble vitamins. And the ileum is important for the absorption of bile salts, fat-soluble vitamins, and vitamin B12. The colon helps with fluid and electrolyte absorption and the production of short-chain fatty acids. Breast milk has been associated with a shortened dependence on PN. It should be used preferentially in infants when it's available and well tolerated and efforts should be made to support lactation. For older children or when breast milk is not available or not tolerated, choosing the appropriate formula is complicated by insufficient data. In the initial postoperative phase, choice of formula may be based on residual bowel anatomy and function. Complex nutrients such as intact protein and long-chain triglycerides increase the intestinal workload and may therefore stimulate a greater adaptive response. Formulas containing complex nutrients may be preferable as the child progresses into the adaptation phase. In the initial postoperative period, continuous feeds are often better tolerated and maximize the potential for nutrient absorption. When possible, transitioning to bolus feeds allows for a more physiological pattern of feeding and prepares for the transition to an oral diet. Children with intestinal failure are at high risk of oral aversion. Developing and preserving oral skills should be prioritized. In infants, bottle and breastfeeding should be introduced as soon as it is safe to do so and advances tolerated, and solids should be introduced when the child is developmentally ready. In older children, introduction of oral nutrition may be done with small amounts of food or formula. As the intestine adapts and changes to account for what's been lost, it's important to continue to closely monitor enteral tolerance and growth with multiple anthropometric measures and not to rely solely on weight, which can be misleading. Children with intestinal failure who require ongoing nutritional support are at risk for developing IFALT, which stands for Intestinal Failure Associated Liver Disease. This encompasses a spectrum of changes to the liver, including cholestasis, fibrosis, and in severe cases can progress to cirrhosis. IFELT occurs due to multiple factors, including prolonged PN and IV lipid support, lack of enteral nutrition, prematurity, and the presence of infection. There are several strategies that can be employed at various stages throughout intestinal adaptation to minimize IFELT. These include avoiding overfeeding, modifying the PN prescription, encouraging enteral intake, preventing and treating any infections, and specific pharmacotherapy when appropriate. Through the initial phase and as the child progresses to the adaptation phase, careful monitoring of growth is the most beneficial tool to assess risk for malnutrition. Whenever possible, and especially in children with chronic abdominal distension, mid-upper arm circumference and tricep skinfold measurements should be used to help with growth monitoring. Children with intestinal failure, especially those with proximal stomas, are at higher risk of sodium deficiency due to increased sodium losses and decreased absorption. Sodium deficiency has been associated with cognitive defects and grow poor growth despite receiving nutrition in excess of expected requirements. Deficiencies in many vitamins and trace elements are common in intestinal failure with limited data to guide supplementation. Measures to prevent or correct deficiencies should be implemented in the early stages and levels should be monitored regularly. Copper and manganese have both been implicated in IFALT and are often withheld from the PN prescriptions in the, in the presence of cholestasis. However, copper deficiency can occur quickly, especially in children with high losses. In cholestatic children, copper supplementation should be decreased by 50%, levels should be monitored closely, and supplementation should be adjusted accordingly. Children in, with intestinal failure are at high risk for malnutrition, but they continue to be at high risk even after enteral autonomy has been achieved. Although PN is critical in the initial phase, oral and enteral nutrition that is tailored to each child's specific anatomy should be introduced early and advanced as tolerated. Close monitoring is essential through the initial phase and well into the adaptive phase to support adequate growth and minimize complications such as IFELT and nutrient deficiencies.